Okay. Here we go. So uh, last time we met, we were discussing World War II and the home front. The conversation we're going to have today is to finish off World War II. We'll talk about the war front, some of the key battles going on, and then uh, we'll finish off with that. All right, so here we go, the war front. So first thing we want to talk about are the key battles in the European theater. So what are some of the key battles in the European theater? <laughs> well, some of the key battles in the European theater included, well, we talked about this already. We talked about the USS Porter, that ridiculous ship. Then we get to the Battle of Stalingrad. The Battle of Stalingrad is the first major defeat of Hitler. And who defeated him in a very big way? Russians. So the Russians. And so this is the first major defeat for Hitler. And he was defeated at the hands of the Russians. So that was a pretty big deal. Battle of Stalingrad, first major defeat for Hitler, defeated by the Russians. Good there? Simple? Easy? Then you have Operation Torch, which is another key uh, operation for the U.S. and its allies. Operation Torch was when the Allies drove the Germans out of North Africa. Operation Torch is when the Germans, or rather the Allies, drove the Germans out of North Africa when we drove the Germans out of North Africa and then invaded which of the Axis powers next? Italy. So it's when we drove the Germans out of North Africa and then invaded Italy. So pretty much the way it works here, as you can see in the image, is that we invade North Africa first, we drive the Germans out slowly, and then once we liberate all of North Africa, we then invade Italy and take them out of the running. So again, it's when we invade North Africa and then invade Italy, driving them out. And then you have the infamous invasion of Normandy, also known as D-Day, also known as Operation Overlord. And D-Day happened on June 6, 1944. And I'm certain many of you guys are already familiar with D-Day. In fact, one of the best uh, ways or best scenes or movies to kind of illustrate D-Day was uh, the landing at Normandy uh, during the movie Saving Private Ryan. We did a pretty fantastic job kind of showing what that would be like um, on the landing of Normandy. And this is a photographer taking the photo as these men are leaving uh, the ship uh, invading the shores of France. This is the largest amphibious assault in human history. This is considered to be the largest amphibious assault in human history. What does that mean, amphibious assault? Amphibious assault. When they're attacking from sea to land. So it's the largest sea to land invasion in human history. Uh, this invasion coordinated over 122,000 troops and they all landed simultaneously on the shores of France. So 122,000 troops landed on the shores of Normandy, making this again the largest amphibious assault in human history. This invasion was led by Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower. So, yes. Amphibious is spelled A M P H I B I O U S. Amphibious, like amphibian. The largest amphibious assault, led by Supreme Allied Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower, who will eventually be uh, one of our presidents in the future, 1952. <coughs> Because of the success of Normandy, this opens up the second front in the war against Germany. Because up until this point, who was really the only country fighting Germany by this time? The British are trying to fight, but they're not really holding up a good invasion of Germany. So who's the only other country really fighting against Germany at this time? 
the Russians. So the Russians are fighting the only open front. The British are launching a few bombing raids periodically, but they're in no position to open up a second front. So on June 6, 1944, we open up the second front in Europe with the largest amphibious assault in human history. And this is a pretty big win for us, uh, D-Day. So you guys should be familiar with the D-Day, June 6, 1944. Again, this is one of the images uh, shortly after D-Day where uh, these Americans captured three uh, German tracked mines. So many people assume these are like tiny robots. Uh, they're not really, they're mines on track so they can like go up hills and then blow up in the Allied camps. But they captured those from Germans. And like we said, it opened up the second front. So just be aware that uh, up until this point, the Germans had to fight the Russians. But with the opening of uh, the invasion of Normandy, the Allies drive the Germans out of France, and then you have the opening of the second front. Good so far? Cool. Cool. Um, then there's the fire bombing of Dresden. It's not just a regular bombing, this is a fire bombing of Dresden. And the basic idea behind the fire bombing of Dresden, though we don't talk about this very much in history, uh, is that this is likely, uh, not one of the deadliest, uh, the fire bombing of Dresden lasted three days, and the idea was to destroy the war factories in the city of Dresden, Germany. The Allies bombed Dresden, if I want to make that clear. Uh, the Allies bombed Dresden, Germany to destroy the German war factories. The goal was to destroy German war factories. And it ends up killing over 100,000 people uh, because the entire city was engulfed in flames. Now, interestingly enough, uh, this three-day bombing raid uh, with fire bombs ends up killing more people than uh, Hiroshima or Nagasaki. So uh, there is a lot of people that die in this uh, fire bombing of the city. Mostly civilians too. Mo not very many soldiers. Mostly civilians are killed in the fire bombing of Dresden. Good there. Then you have the Battle of the Bulge. The Battle of the Bulge was Hitler's last offensive. The Battle of the Bulge was Hitler's last offensive. Pretty much this was his attempt to kind of push back against the D-Day uh, invasion. And so once the Allies are coming in, because the Allies are invading, Hitler decides, okay, let me try to push them back as best I can. And he actually drives them as far uh, back into Belgium as he can. But because the Allies are so overwhelming, by, the, by 1943 there are 3 million Americans uh, that have landed through Normandy, the bulge gets pushed all the way back. So again, the Battle of the Bulge is again Hitler's last offensive. It's his last offensive there. And uh, with this loss, Hitler will eventually lose. On April 30th, the Russians arrive in Berlin. On April 30, the Russians arrive in Berlin, and uh, knowing that the Russians are going to take him prisoner, and he doesn't want that, they're going to they're going to torture him. Hitler decides to commit suicide. It's likely that if the Americans arrived in Berlin first, Hitler probably wouldn't have committed suicide. But because the Russians got there first, and he did not want to enter a Russian prison, they would have tortured the crap out of him. Uh, he decided to kill himself. He, he said, "You know, I'd rather." I'd rather die than be taken captured by the Russians. Germany decides to surrender then unconditionally because there's nothing much they can do. The Russians have arrived, the British have arrived, and the Americans have arrived. And so Germany surrenders unconditionally. Well, that happens. And on May 7th, 1945, we have VE Day. What is VE Day? Victory in Europe Day. Good there? VE Day? Victory in Europe? Everyone seems pretty happy about everything. So that's the end of the war, right? War's over. We all can go home. No, unfortunately, we're fighting two wars at this time. So now that we're done with the uh, European theater, now we got to focus on what? 
Japanese. Now, you have to write this down at all, but um, in history, we always find that it's easier to say, oh, this succeeded, this succeeded, this succeeded. Uh, but there are always possibilities in which these key events might fail. And so uh, Eisenhower actually wrote a letter in the event that D-Day failed. And this is the letter that he wrote, which reads, Our landings in the Cherbourg Havre area have failed to gain a satisfactory foothold, and I have withdrawn the troops. My decision to attack at this time and place was based on the best information available. The troops, the air, and the Navy did all that bravery and devotion to duty could do. If any blame or fault attaches to the attempt, it is mine alone. And so this is a pretty simple way of saying things, but pretty much what he's saying is that 120,000 people have been killed. Because we lost. And if we lost Normandy, that means 120,000 people have been killed or taken prisoner. That means we did not open the second front. And that likely also means that Hitler has taken over all of Europe. FDR would have lost re-election and Winston Churchill would have been driven out of power. And so had we lost D-Day, folks, had that not succeeded, it would be likely that we would have lost World War II. So that was a really critical win for us. But if we didn't, we were always prepared for those what-if scenarios. And I imagine in an alternate reality, someone did read this letter and not, uh, the Nazis did take over all of Europe in another world. But in any case, key battles in the Pacific theater. Key battles in the Pacific theater. Cool. Very. Key battles in the Pacific theater. So, there we go. First off, let's talk about the secret battle of Los Angeles. How many of you guys know about the battle over Los Angeles? Anyone? No one knows? You know what Battle of Los Angeles? All right. So uh, there was a time in which, uh, I mean, most people only know of us attacking, uh, the Japanese attacking Pearl Harbor. But most people don't know that there was a secret Battle of Los Angeles. Uh, and it wasn't a air, like a massive air battle where like planes or whatever else happened over Pearl Harbor, but it was still just as serious nonetheless. And so, again, this will likely not be on your AP test, but it's still something interesting to talk about. What happened was that uh, one night, uh, these giant objects in the air began to fly over the coast of California. Now, we had just been attacked by the Japanese, so we began to freak the hell out. And we thought this was a surprise attack, and so all the artillery cannons along the coast uh, throughout Los Angeles began to fire in the air, and without even asking what these were, we said, we're going to shoot first and ask questions later. And a giant air battle erupts over Los Angeles. We just shoot whatever those things are, and we destroy the hell out of them, because we don't know what these things are. They might be here to kill us. It could be planes, it could be bombs, it could be aliens, it doesn't matter. We're going to shoot first and figure it out later. Well, after destroying all these unidentified flying objects, uh, we began to do some investigation, and it turned out most of these objects, or actually all of these objects, were these weather balloons. Weather balloons sent by the Japanese attached with explosives. Their idea was to send all these balloons over and eventually these balloons would drop their explosives and either kill people or cause fires throughout the U.S. and distract us. Well, you don't know about this, uh, despite the fact that these dropped all across the U.S. It wasn't just here in California, but the majority of them actually dropped in the shaded area here. That's pretty much where they all fell. Um, and we don't talk about this because the U.S. government asked the media to be silent about it. They said, look, we're at war right now. Please don't talk about this. Don't tell anyone. Don't report it. We're asking for your help here. Because if the Japanese know that these balloons are arriving across the coast and they're actually getting here, then they'll think that it worked. And what might they do? Send more. And so we asked the media not to report any of this. Well, the Japanese didn't hear any reports about this, so they began to exaggerate the success of this thing. Oh, the Americans probably are just lying. And they began to tell people that over 10,000 people are being killed by this amazing you know, plan to send balloons with you know, bombs on them. 
when in reality, only six people died uh, in Oregon. And what happened was that it dropped uh, around them. And unfortunately, they were one of the few people that was standing around when these uh, weather balloons eventually dropped their payload. And uh, these six people died. So we did report those six deaths. But we didn't report all the other balloons arriving. The Japanese sent over 9,000 balloons. Only 1,000 actually appeared close to the shores of the United States and entered our airspace. Many of them dropped in the middle of parks. They dropped in the middle of forests. They dropped in lakes, whatever else, when they did uh, cross our shores. Uh, but they didn't really kill anyone. They caused some damage. But again, we didn't report them because we didn't want the Japanese to know that over 1,000 of their balloons got on our shores. The other 8,000 just like kind of were destroyed over the coast of the Pacific because it's a pretty big distance from Japan to America. But again, the secret battle over Los Angeles was a day in which the Japanese actually did attack American soil a few other times besides just Pearl Harbor. Yes? Uh, well, they couldn't. They couldn't control where they were going. They uh, the basic idea was there were times, so they had a basic idea of when those uh, balloons should drop their payload. And so they would just fly across, and then they would guesstimate when that would be. And say, oh, it should take about, I don't know, a week. And then they would just, the balloon should only last about a week. So the balloon either just deteriorate over a week, and it would just land, uh, or again, it would just collapse in the ocean somewhere when it was like pulled by storms or winds, whatever else. But yeah, no, it wasn't like we were controlling them. It would just, that just send all these air balloons to fly in that general direction. The wind will take them. And that's how that, and so what happened. I mean, the wind did blow them all the way over here. Um, and it was bad. And you know, it could have been worse. If the Japanese knew it was working, they would have sent 30,000, 50,000, 60,000 balloons. But we didn't talk about it. So luckily, we didn't have all these balloons. Because if they did, then we couldn't really shoot them all down. So we lucked out there. Anyway, there's that. So if you do have to know, Battle of Coral Sea. The Battle of Coral Sea uh, was the battle to defend Australia from Japanese invasion. The goal was to defend Australia from Japanese invasion. And this is the first battle fought entirely with planes. This is the first battle fought entirely with planes because they fought in the middle of the ocean. Battle of Coral Sea. This is the first battle fought entirely with planes. Because normally you get people fighting on the ground. Uh, but again, it was supposed to defend Australia from a Japanese invasion. And again, here you are. They're just ships sending their planes out to go fight each other and shoot each other. And that's the entire battle. It's just, just to defend Australia from J Japanese invasion. It's a pretty cool battle. Battle of Coral Sea. Then you have the Battle of Midway, which is the turning point of the Pacific War. It's kind of helpful that it's called Midway because it's the turning point. But the Battle of Midway. Pretty much uh, the Battle of Midway was Japan began to retreat. This is where Japan begins to retreat. Up until this point, Japan was expanding and expanding and expanding. But the Americans have now focused their attention on Japan and uh, a lot of the resources on Japan anyway. And what you have is a turning point in the Pacific War when Japan begins to retreat. Battle of Midway. Cool. OK. And so uh, we decide, OK, now it's time to take out the Japanese. And we're going to start with our island hopping strategy. Pretty much the idea is we invade one island at a time. We want to invade one island at a time. Now, many people, you know, this is different from attacking all islands at the same time. Does that make sense? So the idea is we're not going to drive out all the Japanese. We're not going to attack the Philippines and New Guinea and, you know, Midway and Mariana all at the same time. We're going to do it one island at a time. The idea is we want to concentrate our forces and drive out the Japanese by island hopping, going from one island to the next. And again, this is different from attacking all these islands simultaneously. We don't want to do that. We feel that that's just not going to be the best strategy. So we have island hopping strategy. It eventually gets us to the ba uh, island of Iwo Jima. And the Battle of Iwo Jima 
is a allied victory. It's an allied victory. And it allows the US to begin bombing Japan. The Battle of Iwo Jima allows the US to begin bombing Japan. Because the island of Iwo Jima is so close, we can start bombing Japan from the air. You might also be familiar with Iwo Jima for the very famous photo of them raising the American flag, the Battle of Iwo Jima. Then you have the Battle of Okinawa. Battle of Okinawa. And what the Battle of Okinawa taught us was that the Japanese were going to fight to the last man. The Japanese were going to fight to the last man. That the fighting was fierce and over 50,000 Americans were killed. And this is not even mainland Japan, guys. We're not even invading Japan yet. This is just one of the islands outside Japan that Japan controls. But the Battle of Okinawa, we realize that again, the Japanese are going to fight to the last man. And the battle is fierce. I mean, the Japanese are hiding in foxholes with their guns pointed out of the holes. And when the Americans walk by, they'll shoot them. And then when the Americans try to get them out, they'll keep shooting them. And so the Americans ask them to surrender, and the Japanese never surrender. And so what ends up happening is that in order to get these Japanese out, they take flamethrowers, they have to burn them out of their holes, and some of them even refuse to leave. So they have to burn them alive. And so these Japanese are willing to be burned alive. These Japanese are willing to take planes and commit suicide and fly them into American ships. And so what this makes us realize is the Japanese are ruthless. They're willing to die. And so this is a concern because if we invade mainland Japan, what's going to be difficult? Why is it going to be difficult for us? Yeah, we're going to lose a lot more people because the Japanese, are they going to just surrender? No, and the Japanese, they have far more people on mainland Japan. So the concern is, maybe we shouldn't invade Japan. And what the Battle of Okinawa really did was that it made a land invasion less likely. It made a land invasion less likely. And again, why did it make it less likely? Yeah, because the Japanese were going to be willing to fight to the last man, and then why would that be bad for us Americans? Yeah, a lot of casualties. We'd have a lot of casualties here. So we have to now start thinking, okay, are the Japanese going to surrender here? Probably not. Maybe we should come up with an alternative. As we begin developing that alternative, FDR dies. So after winning his fourth term and being inaugurated for the fourth time, uh, FDR dies of a cerebral hemorrhage. And FDR is replaced by President Harry S. Truman, serving from 1945 to 1952. How many times does Truman run for re-election? No. How many times does Truman run for re-election? Once. Why doesn't he run twice? Because he finished the remainder of FDR's term. And did he serve more than half of FDR's term? He did. He served three years of FDR's term. And so when Truman becomes president, that's when they make the two-term limit. So he can't run a third term, which is why he can't. Because they put in a two-term limit eventually. Anyway, Truman is now president, and he inherits the problem with Japan. And he has to figure out, how are we going to deal with the Japanese problem? And so we have the Manhattan Project. And the Manhattan Project was the development of an atomic weapon. The Manhattan Project was the development of the atomic bomb. And the first atomic bomb was detonated on Ju in July 1945 in Alamogordo, New Mexico. The first atomic bomb. It's tested in Alamogordo, New Mexico in July 1945. Nickname of the bomb, Trinity. Trinity was the name of the bomb, if you guys are curious. The Trinity bomb. It's the first atomic bomb ever tested. And it worked. That it was. We're like, that's one bomb. It worked. 
to give you guys an idea of how powerful this bomb is, uh, this Trinity bomb. Uh, so one stick of dynamite might kill like maybe us in the front row here. They'll kill that many people, you know, small with just one stick of dynamite. So uh, a ton of dynamite would be, let's say, just a let's say that entire cabinet here, that glass cabinet from top to bottom, filled with dynamite. That's one ton, probably less. It's probably have to be three times that. That's one ton of dynamite. Just imagine dynamite stacked all the way to the top, three of those. That's one ton of dynamite. Uh, that'll probably blow up, you know, this entire building and maybe some stuff around it. Uh, the Trinity bomb, I believe, was five kilotons. That means three of those times 5,000. And that's how powerful it was. Okay? So that's one bomb. We don't need that many pieces of dynamite. Just one bomb, again, the size of about this. You bound your radium. A bomb about, let's say, the size of my desk destroyed all that. So, like, okay, it works. Now we have a bomb. By the way, this was a secret project between the U.S. and Great Britain. We did not tell who? The Russians. We did not tell the Russians. And aren't the Russians our allies? They're our friends, supposedly. Well, we didn't tell the Russians we were developing a nuclear weapon. Why not? Because they're communists. And do we already know in the back of our heads the Russians are going to be our enemy in the future? Yeah. So we decide, all right, uh, we're going to develop this bomb secretly. We're going to tell the British because we're BFFs, but the Russians, <laughs> not so much. So we have the Potsdam Conference. And at the Potsdam Conference, you have the big three meet again, the big three. The big three, the U.S., Great Britain, and the Soviet Union. Truman is there, Stalin is there, Great Britain has voted Winston Churchill out of power, so you have Clement Attlee. And at the Potsdam Conference, we warn Japan of complete and utter destruction if they do not surrender. Now, does Japan know we have the atomic bomb? No one knows we have the atomic bomb but besides us and Great Britain. So we sit there and we say, hey, surrender or we're going to destroy you. And in Japan's mind, what do they think that looks like? An invasion, maybe dropping of bombs. Okay, so what, you're going to drop like, what, like 10,000 bombs on us? That's going to take, what, like seven weeks? I'm sure we could wait. I mean, what do you guys do? Just drop bombs and invade? We can wait that out. That's not going to be a problem for us at all. So yeah, we welcome it. And the Russians are like, yeah, we'll invade too if you don't do it. But America's not thinking of an invasion. We're not thinking about dropping 10,000 bombs like we did over Dresden. What we're thinking is just dropping one bomb. So we warn Japan. In fact, we fly over Japan and we drop leaflets and pamphlets warning them, urge your government to surrender or we're going to have to destroy you. We're going to have to destroy you if you don't surrender. But does Japan surrender? No. And so on August 6th, 1945, the United States drops the first atomic bomb used in war ever in history on the city of Hiroshima. In the city of Hiroshima, the atomic bomb is dropped, temperatures instantly rise to 9,000 degrees, and 80,000 people are killed instantly. 80,000 are killed instantly at the battle, uh, at the bombing of Hiroshima. It's not even a battle. This is the bombing of Hiroshima. We drop a bomb and we kill 80,000 people. Look at that. Like, within a second, 80,000 dead. Just like that. Well, 80,000 dead, you have 100,000 plus injured. Not to mention all the couple hundred thousand are going to die from radiation poisoning in a month, day, week. And so things are bad. But Japan does not surrender. Japan still does not surrender. In fact, Japan is reading reports of what happened, and they say, that's impossible. This can't be true. Go verify this, because Japan refuses to believe that a bomb of that magnitude can exist. Like, there's no way something like this exists. Something is wrong here. Go figure out what it is. There's no way that one bomb killed 80,000 people. That would at least take four or five days. And you're telling me they did it in what? Three minutes? No, no. Get this confirmed. And so they start hearing reports. They start getting confirmation. Japan's like, I don't know about this. And they start considering invasion or start considering surrender. And again, here's uh, Hiroshima, completely destroyed. 
This is one of those rare photos of someone on the ground in Japan taking a photo of the mushroom cloud uh, from the ground floor. We usually have photos from the top, but this is a rare photo of someone heard the blast and they turned their camera towards Hiroshima and they were able to see what the blast looked like from a Japanese perspective. Now again, Japan does not surrender. And on uh, August 8th, not yet, we are getting close to, on August 8th, Russia prepares to invade Japan. So August 6th, we drop the bomb. August 8th, Russia prepares to invade Japan. Now, Japan now starts seriously considering surrender because they don't want Russia to invade. No one wants you. To, no one wants a Russian to invade you. Russia is horrible. When they invade you, they will kill you. They will torture your people. They will destroy your economy. So Japan starts considering. Well, maybe we should surrender. But Russia is already preparing for invasion because they promised they would to America. Now, does America want Russia to invade Japan? No, because if Russia invades Japan, we're never going to get them out. So we say, okay, well, we have to end this quickly. And Japan, are you going to surrender? No, let us think about it. Okay, do we have time to let them think about it? Because Russia is right there. Russia's not that far. They're about to invade. And so in order to make them surrender now, in order to end this war quickly, and also to prevent a Russian invasion, we bomb them again. And on August 9th, a day after the Russians prepared for invasion, we bombed the city of Nagasaki. And here we drop a larger bomb and it kills 60,000 people. Now many people wonder why if this bomb was bigger did it kill less people. There are two reasons for this. Number one, Nagasaki was not as populated. The second reason was the height at which that bomb exploded. Um, here's the ground floor. When Little Boy, uh, the first bomb Little Boy was dropped, it was dropped at a very uh, high altitude. So that means it killed all those people. Does that make sense? The idea was that it killed all those people from a higher altitude. When they dropped Fat Man, the, the, the bigger bomb, they dropped it at a much smaller altitude, which means it affected a smaller radius of people. So while we were killing and bombing, we were also testing the atomic weapon to seeing how much damage is there a difference in damage based on how uh, high we actually activate that bomb. In any case, we killed 60,000 people here. Japan has no choice but to surrender. And on August 14th, Japan officially surrenders on VJ Day 1946. Just to give you guys a quick idea of what those bombs looked like, there you go. Lights in the back real quick. atomic weapon. 
not by any means a small weapon. Very, very powerful. So we ask ourselves, why did America drop the bomb? Well, for four major reasons. Number one, to force the unconditional surrender of Japan. Number one, we want to force the unconditional surrender of Japan. This is why we dropped the bomb. No peace negotiations, just complete surrender. Second reason why we dropped the bomb? To save American lives during a land invasion. Why? Why did we think that a land invasion would be uh, problematic for us? You know, what battle did we learn that a land invasion would be problematic? Battle of what? Okinawa. So the Battle of Okinawa made us realize that a land invasion would not be good. We would lose too many American lives. Number three, we want to show off American superiority to the Soviets. Pretty much, we knew that the Soviets were going to be our next enemy, so we launched the bomb moves today, Soviets. Don't get any ideas. If you try to you know, conquer the rest of the world, we have the bomb. So don't even think about you know, doing anything stupid. And lastly, is to keep the Soviet Union out of Japan. Like I said before, once the Soviets invade Japan, are we going to have a hard time getting them out? Yeah. And so we want to keep them out as best we can. So that's why we dropped the bomb. Questions there? Okay. Don't worry about that. Uh, last thing we have to talk about are allied conferences. This is not going to be too long here, but we do need to talk about uh, the different conferences that were around at this time. Uh, the allies meet four times to kind of discuss uh, what to do about uh, how to fight this war. So the first is the Casablanca conference. And at the Casablanca conference, it was just uh, Churchill and uh, FDR, just the US and Great Britain. And pretty much they discussed two things here. Number one, they agreed to unconditional surrender of all its enemies. So they agreed to the unconditional surrender of its enemies. So they're not going to accept a negotiation, a peace settlement. They, ex they agreed to an unconditional surrender only of its enemies. An unconditional surrender of its enemies. The second thing they agreed to was invading North Africa, or rather invading Italy, before opening the second front. The second thing they agreed to was invading Italy before opening the second front. Again, invading Italy before opening the second front. Good there? <coughs> Okay, that's Casablanca. We're invading Italy before opening the second front. Next one, Tehran. Here they are, sinning again. And at this conference, you have Stalin, FDR, and Churchill. At the Tehran conference, in November, December 1943, Tehran conference, November, December 1943, here they discussed pretty much one thing. They planned the D-Day invasion. They organized the D-Day invasion because that's a pretty big invasion. You know, planning and coordinating 120,000 troops. And the troops weren't just from America, guys. This is British, French, American, Canadian, uh, Latin American, African, Asian troops all landing on the shores of Normandy at the same time. So it required a lot of planning for uh, this. So we did that. Uh, they also planned for the post-war world. They also planned for the post-war world. They planned for the post-war world and they also planned for free elections. They planned for the post-war world and free elections. So again, once they had to rebuild, they're gonna have to promote Free election, and here they are standing right here. Friends. They should have a sitcom. It's Churchill, FDR, and Stalin. I'd watch that. Then we have the Yalta Conference. 
Look how uh, old FDR looks. He's gonna die soon. Just want to make that clear. He's gonna die very soon. He's gonna die in a month. In any case, FDR here at the Yalta conference. Pretty much what they discuss uh, is, oh yes, the creation of the United Nations. They discuss creating the United Nations. They discuss creating the United Nations. And that they would divide Germany into four zones. They would divide Germany into four zones. Last conference, you guys already know. Again, sitting down. They never do anything besides sit at these conferences. Potsdam Conference, you guys already know. Potsdam Conference, July to August 1945. Uh, they ask for Japan's unconditional surrender. This is where they ask for Japan's unconditional surrender or else we'll kill them. And we end up using this. This is the uh, little boy, by the way, compared to Fat Man. This is little boy, the other bomb. But uh, this is what we dropped on Hiroshima. Cool. Uh, they also agree to denazification. Denazification. You know, we would denazify things, take away uh, Nazi signs, and get rid of the Nazis, and all that jazz. So the aftermath of World War II. Forty-six to fifty-five million people died, depending on who you talk to. Uh, which historians do the counts? Three hundred thousand Americans are killed, so three times the death toll of World War One. Thirty-five million wounded. Three million missing. 25 million civilians killed, 6 million Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, handicapped political enemies killed, and you have the massive destruction of cities. Entire countries and cities just completely destroyed by the war. Yeah? Because it the records are not 100% accurate, and a lot of these are guesstimations. And so some historians will say on a conservative that 46 million people were killed. Other historians will say actually it's upwards of 55 million, because it depends on, um, again, for example, like Stalin, he just sent soldiers all the time and didn't keep record. I mean, he himself killed like so many people of his own. Uh, you also don't. You also have to count the people that died just of basic starvation, hunger, whatever else. So it really just depends. The number is a guesstimation, because at that point it's really hard to know. And then again, also when you look at the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it's about eighty thousand people that killed it were killed in Hiroshima. We don't really know because all the government records were burned up in the firestorm that followed. So it just got really bad. Waiting for a few more people here. Okay. Uh, now there was the Holocaust, you guys also need to be aware of. Uh, and the American response to the Holocaust initially, the initial American response was, oh well, it's not our problem. Uh, in fact, there was one instance in which a, a ship full of Jews was able to escape Germany and come to America, and America sent the ship back. Because America said, that's, that's not our problem. 
Like, by the way, to be fair, we didn't know they were killing Jews. That didn't happen until the very end of the war. We just thought that they were just being political prisoners. And we said, we don't, we don't want to deal with this. So go back. We're not going to take you. We have quotas now. And so we sent them back, not knowing that they were eventually going to be killed. But that did happen. Uh, things do get better, though, as public opinion changes once we start hearing about all the terrible things happening to the Jews. And so you have the International Rescue Committee, uh, which is intended to help Jewish refugees. It's supposed to help Jewish refugees. The IRC is supposed to help Jewish refugees. Uh, you also have the War Refugee Board that's supposed to help Jews after the war. It's supposed to help Jewish refugees after the war. You know, their homes are destroyed. Where are they going to go? You know, many of them need food, care because they're so emaciated. So, the War Refugee Board help Jewish refugees after the war. IRC was to help them escape. Uh, the WRB is to help them after the war. So, post-war political issues, what are we going to have to deal with now that this war is over? Well, there's a pretty major thing that we have to deal with during this wartime, during this uh, post-war era. And one of the major post-war political issues are going to be the spread of communism. The biggest fear now that we have Germany and Japan where we want them, now that they've surrendered and you know, quit the war, is now... Russia. The Soviet Union, or Russia, I'm going to use the terms interchangeably because you can, but the Soviet Union or Russia, um, they're going to be the next threat because they're going to try to spread communism and that spread includes America and that's going to be the major issue for us because does our government and communism work together? No, it doesn't. They don't work well together. And in fact, Russia's brand of communism is more like dictatorship. It's not like real communism. So that will become a problem. We'll have to deal with the issue of Germany as well. I mean, what are we going to do about Germany? This will be another major issue we have to deal with. The German question will be an issue. Do we unify Germany? Do we make them strong? Do we keep them weak? They have started two wars. So what role will Germany play in this new world? And again, you'll have communism versus capitalism, democracy versus dictatorship. You will have these two factions fighting over each other or against each other in this new world of democracy and dictatorship, communism versus capitalism. By the way, fun fact, uh, this is a picture of Superman and Superman. This Superman is from the alternate universe in which his spaceship crash lands in the Soviet Union, not in Kansas. And so he becomes a communist, and it's pretty awesome. So if you guys want to read about that story, it's a comic book called The Red Sun. It's pretty amazing about what happens when Superman becomes a communist. And like he becomes a real communist. It's, it's pretty good. Anyway, that's Unit 9.